matter of Legio versus Divine Council. May it please the court, I am Beth Zweig from NASA Suffolk Law Services Committee, and I am appearing on behalf of the appellant, Tina Leggio. I would like to reserve two minutes of my time for rebuttal, please. You may, of course. Thank you. This is a case about a struggling family who lost their food stamps, or SNAP benefits, for one reason and one reason only. Two of the children in the household started college. Counsel, could we look at the... Um the regulation, right? 273.9, um, and it's the support and alimony payments, right? So it seems you agree on, on this point that it depends on where this income, this, this child support is going. Is it income of, unearned income of the mother, or is it unearned income of the child? And the problem, or the, the issue I have with your interpretation of this regulation, forgetting deference for, for a second, is it says support or alimony payments made directly to the household from non-household members. And if I take out directly to the household, your argument doesn't change at all. I mean, it seems to me you're reading this part of the reg to say support or alimony payments made from non-household members. Because then I would look, as I do with every other subdivision here, like wages, and say, whose is it? Is it the moms? Is it the, is it the students? So what does directly to the household mean, assuming we apply the rule that it has to mean something? We are not proceeding on the argument of 273.9, um, which discusses the payments made on behalf of non-household members used exclusively for the care and maintenance of non-household members. Rather, 273.5D specifically states that the income of ineligible college students shall be treated as handled in 273.11D. Um, so that provision assume, is not governing. Assume this was an ineligible student for a minute. This provision I just read would apply. Correct. So it doesn't really matter household, non-household member. What this provision is talking about is who is the income going to. So it seems that argument is just a backdoor way of avoiding this provision. But this provision seems directly related to child support payments and how you are going to allocate them. So once you figure out that, and I think your adversary concedes, if it's income of the student, it goes to D and it's income of the student. But first we have to get by, I think, what does directly to the household mean? Because it seems there's a very good argument to me that it means directly, where is it directly going? It's going directly to the mother in this case. The provision talks about if it's directly to the household, the question is whether it's used exclusively, according to that provision, whether it's used exclusively for the care and maintenance of non-household members. But where, are you, where do you find that? Uh, I, I believe that's in the direct language of the provision, um, 273 point nine specifically says that money received and used for the care and maintenance of a third party beneficiary is not a household member. However, we aren't proceeding. That's a, but that's a different, yeah, that's, a, that's a different subdivision. That, yeah. That's sort of going, I think, to your alternative argument. Right. Uh, Can I ask you about, is it, in the record, there's a child support order, right? Correct. And that directs the payment be made to the SCU. Is that right? It, As a factual matter, are the payments being made to the SCU? That would be the knowledge of the state respondent. Um, I, my understanding is that the SEU has been involved to some degree. Um, however, I. So you don't know whether. You know, I'm just not, asking a factual question. Yeah, Do you know whether I, the payments I, are going to the SEU or not? I can't answer that. I don't know. And that's the key provision in this case, um, more so than 273. Point uh, five even, um, is the social services law 111H4, which expressly resolves the dispute as to whether child support is income to the parent or the child, because um, that but, but stat... That's, that's why I asked the questions, because right. that's dependent on whether it's going to the SCU, and you just told me you don't know whether it is. That, that would be information that the state so, But when it goes to SCU, then it, then it goes from there to someone else, right? And, and 
Do, are you familiar with? So then the, the support order would say it's payable to so and so through the through the support collection unit, right? My I, I believe the SEU has been involved to some degree in this case, but I don't I can't but answer. My point is that SEU yeah. that then doesn't well the order probably would say like it might be in a it might be in a support proceeding between two parents and it would say it would be payable to the other parent through the support collection unit right Do, it, it, it may say that in it, it might say that in the order if that were the case um, I, I, I again my understanding is that the primary method of collection and distribution of the child support funds in this case has been from the custodial, uh, non-custodial parent to the custodial parent, but that's just a mechanism of collection. And for the case to hinge on whether uh, the funds go through the support collection unit and then to the custodial parent and then to the child or directly from the non-custodial parent to the custodial parent, uh, uh, in our view, is would be an arbitrary well, distinction. I thought, that's, I thought that's why you directed us to 111H4. Correct, because in 111H4, it means that in New York, the state legislature has already determined that for purposes of social services law, uh, child support is countable as income to the child instead of to the but parent. Let's say that conflicted with this. And the federal regulation said, <clears throat> no, that we're going to do it this way. Who wins? The fed if the federal regulations were absolutely clear on who the child support income is countable to, um, then, then the federal regulation would win out. Do you know I how it's treated for uh, purposes of taxes or anything of that nature? Um, for purposes of taxes, it's not countable, it's not deductible for the pay Right, spouse. but would it go on, do you, so, all right, so it wouldn't go on anybody's tax Correct. returns. Are, are you familiar with the child support formula? To some degree. Okay, well, it's been a while since I practiced family law, but, but to my understanding, it's still the case that there is a formula, and that formula directs the non-custodial parent to pay a certain percentage of that parent's income as, you know, it's got a lengthy definition of how you define income, but once you get to that income number, you pay a certain percentage, and for one child, that percentage is or was 17%. For, this, for two children, it was 25%. For three children, it was 29% and so on and so forth. So it, 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 that, for purposes of that formula, it's not a direct pro rata allocation that you can divide a child support payment if there are four children four equal ways. Does, does that make sense? So, so how does that affect your argument that it should be pro rata um, yeah. divided? Uh, so I, I understand um, that, that it's a sort of comp Complicated to some degree formula, um, but at no point in the course of this litigation has the state respondent argued that the two-fifths deduction is inappropriate, um, and the appellate division did find that it was appropriate to prorate the funds out by using uh, a two-fifths formula. I, I see that the red light's on, but uh, if I may. Yes, you may. Um, they're putting aside whether it's the child or the parent, um, what about the issue of deference to uh, OTDA's position? Why shouldn't we give deference to that position? The reason why deference is not appropriate in this case is if there are a few different arguments. First of all, 111H4 of social services law gives an answer in this question. Um, it says the New York State Legislature has made a determination that child support is uh, uh, to be deemed for all purposes to be the property of the person for whom such money is paid. That would be the child. Um, in addition, the uh, OTADA has had a policy. My understanding of that, by the way, is that it was the that the, the reason for that determination was that it was as between the payor and the payee parent, not as between the parents and or the child. Uh, uh, the is that, could, is, could that be the case? I, I, you know, the plain language of it, um, 
the property for whom such money is paid, that would be the child's property because that's the property of the person for whom such money is paid to uh, us. That's the plain meaning of the word, uh, th that phrasing, um, to whom such money is paid. And beyond that, the state has not had a policy on this, uh, on this issue. Uh, it uh, seems to be a bit of a, uh, after the fact, rationalization, uh, there is a case from 2013, a fair hearing decision, where the agency um, found that child support income is, uh, in a similar circumstance to this, is excluded fr from being countable as income to the food stamp household. So there hasn't been a consistent policy of the agency. In addition, there's no administrative directive or informational letter or any other uh, policy on this subject. So. Uh, deference is not appropriate when there is an answer in social services law and there's no ex pre existing policy. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Council? Thank you very much. Andrew Amond for the uh, commissioner. Council, are you familiar with the uh, decision uh, to which your adversary just referred? The November 2013 decision after fair hearing? Yes, is that uh, inconsistent with your position here? Uh, it is to a limited extent. Uh, we conceded uh, below that that decision was incorrect. And by the way- Is that the only decision that's contrary to the current position? That is the only one uh, with the debatable exception of two decisions cited in uh, my friend's reply brief that we responded to in our response to the amicus brief. Both of those decisions post-date uh, the 2018 decision by the second department and apply the income attribution rule uh, prescribed by the second department. But, but the 2013 decision, wasn't the, the ineligible student there also the parent? There was a different 2013 Oh, okay, decision, I'm sorry, then, I, then uh, I'm confused. Which is also cited in okay. their reply and, and in our response. So can I ask you to address my yes. two questions about 111H? First, the sure. factual question of where these monies are paid. Are they paid in the sport, housing, uh, sport collection unit or not? And second, what your understanding of 111H is? Uh, so our understanding is that the money is paid by check to the parent. Uh, that is what she alleged. Uh, she's never claimed that... The uh, order, you realize, says something different. I, I do realize that, okay. but uh, sometimes arrangements on the Fine. ground, parents can agree. Uh, in any event, 111H does not apply here, uh, and even if it because. did... Well, because there's no, there's no allegation uh, that she has ever made. She's never disputed that she gets the check directly. She's never asserted the involvement of the collection unit. Uh, and in any event... Uh, Directly from the person responsible for paying the support. Is that what you mean? Correctly. She's never... She said, no I get intermediary. A, check, a check from my husband. that check or passing the check on to her. Correct. Okay. Uh, but she has said, I get a check from my husband. So <clears throat> is it correct that both sides agree that the pro rata approach is a correct approach? We agree that it would be the correct approach if this uh, were money uh, under Section uh, 7 CFR 273.9 D6 mm -hmm. uh, that applies for payments that are, in fact, used for the care and maintenance of a third-party beneficiary who is not a household member. That but this isn't a third-party beneficiary, so... It's also not someone who is not a household member. You know what I wonder is, is in the underlying this all is an accepted, we defer because it's rational, Correct. right? So in, in our deferring because it's rational, the pro rata approach to the calculation of household income, which if I have it correctly, uh, exempts the, that it counts the household income that the uh, college students receive, but then it's deducted for food stamp purposes, right? If they actually received 
uh, income, say they were working 10 hours a week mm -hmm. instead of 20. There's a special provision in, in, <laughs> yes, for their, college their wages, students. Right. So, so, what, so what it says to me, though, so for the calculation, it says that we take these, the, the pro rata section of their child support income that the college students would receive out. And, of course, that seems totally irrational to me. I know of no household in America that actually operates that way, where the money comes in and then it's divided by four or five, whatever the number is, and then you, you say, okay, this is for this child and this is for this child and this amount's for this child. That's not how rationally, how things actually operate and it, it, it seems uh, um, to, to, to argue that a child support percentage assigned to each child is, is on its face irrational. And particularly in light of the effect of it all, because the effect of this, of course, is that uh, 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 in 2018, I believe, 69 point, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics, 69% of uh, uh, high school students went on to college. Of those 69% that went on to college, 71% uh, of them come from non-traditional households, households with one parent, say, in that form. Those are the bulk of people that are on food stamps. So what we're saying is everybody who's on food stamps um, uh, is, a, is a family that genuinely needs it. it. It makes some sense. And we've devised what seems to be a formula that I don't really fault the agency, but it appears through the regulations that are totally irrational. Um, and I'm wondering, um, in this calculation, that ends up with this, in my mind, unfair and absurd result. Is there anything that the state of New York could do about it, or are we stuck with this calculation? The state of New York is stuck with this calculation only in so far as there is a child support payment that is, in fact, directed to someone who is not living in the household. I see. That's the only uh, Does it make purpose. a difference, so then to you, does it make a difference? I just want to understand your position. If the, the um, non-custodial parent makes the payment directly to the child, you say that's easy, that's the child's income, right? Correct. What if the non-custodial parent makes the payment to the custodial parent and then the custodial parent gives the child some pro rata share of that money every week or every month and says, this is yours and you take care of your needs. Or, what, or, what's or a further uh, hypothetical uh, puts it in a uh, bank account uh, uh, that is only controlled by the child. The dispositive fact in all of those scenarios is, is the child living at home? If the child is living at home, uh, then the exception for <laughs> money used for the care of third parties who are not in the home uh, doesn't apply. The, what, what, mat what does apply and what matters is, for the reasons uh, Judge Fahey intimated, this child support, whether it comes through the SCU or directly from uh, the petitioner's ex-husband, is money in her pocket that is available to her to use for food and other expenses. So I think in part these hypotheticals are asking mm -hmm. if, if what you all have done is adopt a presumption and the presumption is proved at least in a particular case to have been rebutted, which I think there's an argument here that you may have done that, but would the presumption still hold? Does the court have to say the presumption still holds in the face of contrary evidence in an individual case? Uh, I'm not sure I understand where the presumption has Well, the been presumption, rebutted. as I understood it, that you represented was that the money goes to the parent who's controlling it, and therefore they can use it for the benefit of the household, and so it's household income. If I've misunderstood what you represented, please clarify. That's, that's correct. Okay. So then if, 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 again, the parent puts forth evidence that there's a factual finding, that it, it is credible, and rebuts that underlying presumption, are we bound to recognize the presumption? That's what I'm saying to you. Well, uh, first, you, the, the presumption would still apply in this case because there's been no evidence uh, of a transfer of funds directly to the children. Well, Second, uh, I know the hypotheticals wanted to uh, uh, present a case where the parent has release 
all control, but it's clear in this case that her position has been, I only use it for this child. I know you presume otherwise, but I only use it for this child, and I can't find anything but a fact finding that agrees that that is what that, that has accepted that representation. What matters in this case is that these are children in her home, and she retains discretion, absolute well, discretion isn't as a matter the of law of the rule to use it that, for the household. That, that, that the, the state doesn't want to have to go into the household and, and try to enforce and figure out, okay, what's really going on here? Is the, is the mother, it, she has the discretion and she may exercise that discretion to give the money to the child or she may not, or maybe one month she does and another month she doesn't. And, and, and the state is looking for a hard and fast rule that says unless that money goes directly from the other parent to the child, m this parent is, still has discretion for what that parent wants to do with it. I, I, yes, isn't that, yes, that is the essence of our position. That's the point of the rule. And I, yes. just, I just want to make, I think you answered this before, I just want to make sure I understood the mm -hmm. answer correctly. Assume all these children are living in the home, but the non-custodial parent here, the father, d decides to write five separate checks. He does the proration himself and sends them directly to each child. What happens, in your view, to the SNAP benefits? If the, the, the money that is received directly by uh, the ineligible student children uh, and bypassing the custodial parent right. altogether. Goes straight to the child. They're living in the household, though. That, right, but that would be uh, excluded under. And uh, so the household would be SNAP eligible under that circumstance. Yes, and I'd like to just respond to the idea that there is any unfairness uh, or irrationality in the result that this household, uh, unfortunately, was uh, unable to qualify for SNAP. There is nothing unfair, irrational, or unreasonable about a regulatory interpretation that reflects the reality on the ground that mom is the one receiving this money and retaining discretion over how to use it, and applying that rationale in a way that provides an inducement for all of the members of the household uh, to become eligible for SNAP. An overall programmatic goal that's very important here is... Uh, Council, your light is off, so before you have to sit down, I think you got the meat of your point out there. Uh, uh, I, I'm not so clear why we have to decide whether or not the mother is the recipient of the child support or the child is the recipient of the child support. Given I, I read the federal statute and the regs to mean child support counts. If you're a member of the household, even if you're ineligible, child support counts. Uh, tell me what uh, interrelationship of these provisions requires us to actually figure out this other question. The other question comes into play only if there is a child who is living outside of the household, who is not a household member, because there's a specific income exclusion in the SNAP Act and the state and federal regulations. Which is not this case. Which is not this case. Uh, and in an effort to be generous uh, as much as possible to parents, custodial parents receiving child support, OTDA has recognized that if a parent actually transfers the money to a student who is outside the home, then that deduction should apply. But that's not this case. So again, that is why do we case. have to resolve this question of whether it's the child's support or the custodial parent or the person who's responsible for receiving it and has control over it? Oh, sorry. Uh, the reason that it would matter in this case is that if the child support is truly deemed to be income of the, uh, mm -hmm. the supported child, Mm -hmm. And even if 111H would make it otherwise the child's property, there's no dispute that the parent is the one to whom it's payable. Uh, the support order referenced by Judge uh, Wilson says that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That money, if it is rare income, if they went out and got a job and worked 10 hours a week, mm -hmm. they got their paycheck, they were controlling how they used their paycheck, mm -hmm. then the federal regulations say that for an ineligible student, that money would be But expected. I understood the regs to mean that a student like the children in this case, mm -hmm. right? If, if they're not participating in, in, in a work program as explained in the fine in the federal statute and the regs, you count 
child support in that household. So it doesn't matter whether it's the person who's receiving it, the adult, or the child. Am I misreading something? The misreading would be if there is a child support check, and this is exceedingly rare. This, I mean, these are already kind of unicorn cases, uh, but you know, this would be a unicorn with sparkles or something. Okay, um, two, two unicorns. In, in that rare case, the child support would be treated as income uh, to the uh, child uh, because the parent never exercises, who's uh, the head of the household never exercises control over. Counsel, before you sit down with the chief judge's permission, I'd just like to go back to deference for a minute. Sure. Um, you know, I agree with Judge Rivera. I, I believe there is a way to read these clearly. But if we were going on, on deference, We've already discussed that the agency arguably has one or, or more potentially inconsistent interpretations. It seems to me in the examples you cite of other states, the position of the state agency is in, uh, codified in a manual at least, right? And you do not seem to have that. We have not reduced that position to uh, a, uh, an administrative directive Right. At this time. And we you could. also didn't write these regs, right? This we, federal well, government wrote them. We, the fact that this is derived and largely controlled by federal regs uh, doesn't in itself defeat uh, agency deference. Doesn't to defeat it, but we said is, one of the reasons to defer to a state agency is that they wrote the regs. And lastly, we have a case, this court, Rodriguez v. Perales, where there's kind of a tie with the federal, similar, not this program, different program, but joint. Um, federal government saying one thing, agency saying one thing, state saying another. We say, look, the feds wrote these regs. We're going to go with the deference to the federal agency. That, at least by trial courts, has been interpreted to mean no deference to the state agency in interpreting a regulatory scheme controlled uh, and written by the federal government. So if you combine all of those factors here, an inconsistent position, lack of a formal statement, um, you didn't write the regulations, and you're a state agency interpreting a federal program and regulations. What level of deference should we give to the agency here? There are a number of uh, issues here uh, with assuming that uh, OTDA should not get uh, deference. There uh, is the fact that while this is uh, a federal regulatory scheme that's implemented by the states, the states are given discretion, uh, including, and this is by the federal government, over the particular area of how to allocate uh, child support as income. Where is they, that? Where is with that delegation found that of discretion? Uh, it's discussed in, in our brief. Uh, I'm, but it's a federal reg? How is it delegated to the state agency to interpret what's child support, how it's allocated? There's a general delegation by Congress and then by FNS to the states to implement, to adopt and implement reasonable uh, interpretations as necessary uh, to uh, That don't otherwise scheme. conflict with the statute and the federal regs, correct? Correct. Sure. May I ask, so, did you include it in the state plan, this interpretation? The state we, plan, you have they, to submit to the feds for approval? The state has otherwise, has otherwise made uh, FNS aware of its uh, position. FNS has not, they haven't said we're wrong, they haven't said we're auditing you, they haven't said give us the money back. How did, how did you make them aware? What does that mean? Uh, in this case, it was uh, an email communication uh, with representatives uh, at FNS. Okay. Um, Thank you, counsel. Sorry, is there just one more of point I could respond Please. to, uh, Judge? Uh, uh, Gar uh, Garcia. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Judge Garcia's question. I'm having trouble with my name. <laughs> we, we have not uh, written this down in an administrative directive. We could, uh, and we might after this case, but uh, <laughs> there, is, there has been one inconsistent decision after fair hearing out of thousands and thousands of uh, such decisions that get issued every year and uh, well, I nine. Thought were, wait, I thought these were unicorn cases. They are. But I mean, my you, daughter does have a thousand sort of sparkly unicorns, but right. I didn't assume you did. 
Well, that, that, that point is actually relevant to what the, the last thing that I just wanted to say, which is that they have identified one case uh, that goes the other way, and we have identified 10. The, the amended decision after fair hearing here and nine other decisions cited in our brief that consistently apply the rationale we have articulated in this case. And in any event, that is a reasonable interpretation of the regulations, uh, which is uh, worthy of at least some modicum of deference by the courts. Thank you, sir. Thank you Counsel? very much. Uh, just to bring up a few issues that were brought up. Um, so the issue here is that the child support, and this was, this was brought up um, to some degree, the state acknowledged that the pro rata share, at the two-fifths, was used exclusively for the care and maintenance of the college students. Um, and counting the child support against the four remaining household members, um, that is the uh, mother, Tina Leggio, uh, and the 16, 12, and nine-year-old children, that's a problem because in essence, the household ends up being doubly punished. But all also, they have let me to just, do is, is, is comply with the eligibility requirements for students. Isn't, isn't that true? And then, then that changes the it, whole thing. It, it is true that they would no longer be ineligible students. Um, and it is true that uh, 273.5D combined with 273.11 makes it absolutely clear that the income of the ineligible college student, that is the college student who is invisible to the SNAP household, that income is excluded from the SNAP household income. Okay. okay. It is so, true so that. So let, let me just understand. Yeah. So you agree that if child support is going to, let's just use this phrase for right now, the custodial adult, adult who's responsible to get, right, by court order, the, that that would count, right? That, that's the individual in the household. That would count towards the household income, correct? Not if it's used exclusively for the care and maintenance of the ineligible college student. But, but even... No, no, no. no. Uh, I don't sorry. think you understand. I'm sorry. Me. The child yeah. support is going to this individual right? And they use it for the household. Let me try it that way. You, you agree it counts? They, and, and, and let me try it this way. Yeah, yeah. And if the child support is going to the college student, the at least minimum part-time college student, who then is not complying with the work requirements set out in the federal statute and regs, that that would also count if they're part of the household. Do you agree with that statement? No. Why uh, not? Uh, unless I, I might have misunderstood what you said. No, I'm, I'm uh, sure I'm getting it wrong, but that's what I'm asking. Uh, the income of the ineligible college student, as long as it's countable to the ineligible college student, is not countable, is excluded. An ineligible student is a member of the household. Not, not that they're a non-member. A member of the household who doesn't comply with the work requirements that, that such college student would be subject to. Doesn't that child support count towards the household? No, college students are not subject to work requirements. There are specific eligibility guidelines laid out in 273.5. Well, they cannot be eligible if they don't satisfy work requirements unless they're otherwise excluded. They, there are a number of ways that students can become uh, eligible for food stamps, but if they're ineligible, it's as if they're treated as though they're invisible to the household. That's the way I look at it. Um, so it, it's as if they don't exist in the household. So that would mean, in our estimation, that not only, so the household size actually decreases. In this case, the household size decreased from six members of the household to four members of the household as a result of uh, and, and what that actually meant is the income eligibility levels and the maximum possible benefit level decreased accordingly. But then the income that was used exclusively for the care and maintenance of those children then counted against the four remaining household members. So what it did is it, in essence, doubly punished the kids for going to college. Could, could the adult who receives the child support use it for everyone but the child? If, Would that be permissible? If, the, if it was used for everyone but the child, I, I actually do believe it would be permissible because of the 
social services law, let, um, let me, 111H4. But Can money's I? fungible, so th this child support is coming in, and I think this is part of it too. And, and let's just say for the moment that, that mom, and maybe who knows, some other family member, has, has their own earned income or other income. It all goes together and it all goes to pay for stuff, right? So how do you say whether that child support income is going directly to the child or not going directly to the child or is being used for everybody else and not the child? How, how can you even make that determination? Well, in this case, it was a state respondent who made the determination that the funds were being used exclusively for the care and maintenance of the ineligible students. Um, and it was brought up over the course of the hearing, but the state's amended decision made it absolutely clear that the, that the pro rata share of the child support income was in fact used exclusively for the care and maintenance of the ineligible students. And by counting it against the four remaining household members, that child support income, what that means is that these students really should not be using the money for their own benefit, for their own food needs if they aren't eligible for food stamp benefits, for SNAP benefits. And so the parents and the three uh, children can use it on themselves. Is it, isn't that about a policy choice, though, that we are not able to ignore? Well, it's, it, that, that could be a policy choice, but what we're saying that it shouldn't be. Um, can, I, can I ask you this? Is there a way that the college students in this case could have been eligible uh, um, for food stamps uh, and, uh, and having um, uh, and raise a divisor from four to six in this case. There uh, is. How, how would that have been done? There is a mechanism. Um, Tell me, if, how would it be done? Uh, if, if they had participated in a work study program. So, a work study instance. program, something, something that amounted to 20 hours a week, is that right? 20 hours a week is another provision. Uh, some of these provisions are easier said than done. Um, in terms I understand of, that. But, yeah. but there are ways that are laid out in 273.5 for I students see. to become household members. Thank you, Council. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.